I'm now going to talk through the week three part two code file, which contains code related to linear regression slash ANOVA and also some other R functions that we didn't get to, but I want you to be aware of so that R is as useful to you as possible as you move forward. This R file is well commented. In other words, I've written essentially everything I'm going to say now in the file itself. So if you're comfortable reading the code file, you don't need to listen to this video. I'm making this video in case it helps you to hear this rather than read uh, read the comments that are in the file. So let's start with regression. The command for running a linear regression is LM for linear model. LM. So here's how we do it. You write LM and then as the input you write the name of the outcome vector, so perhaps I'm trying to predict sepal length from the iris data set, then tilde and then the name of the predictor, and I'll show you how to have multiple predictors. But if you have one predictor, this is x, and this over here is y, you write y tilde x. Lm y tilde x. And the best practice is to save your output, give it some name rather than print it out onto the screen. So perhaps I'm going to save my output as lm1. So then once I've run this line, now lm1 has a value, and then I can say summary lm1, and here's what I get. What comes out of the summary? Now, not everything that's stored in this LM1 is summarized here, but some of it is. It repeats to us what we gave it. It reminds us what the regression was. This is the same thing I typed in. It summarizes the residuals. The residuals from this model range from negative 1.56 to 2.22. Here's the main part that you want. For each of the coefficients, we have an estimate. So the estimated beta zero, the coefficient for the intercept or the intercept coefficient is 6.5. And the estimated coefficient for sepal width is negative 0.22 here. These are our estimates. Then we get the standard error for each of those estimates. We have t statistics for each of those estimates, which consists of taking the estimates and dividing by the standard errors. So 6.5 divided by 0.48 is 13.6. And then a p-value associated with each of those coefficients. The p-values correspond to a t-test for the null hypothesis that that particular coefficient is equal to zero. So here if we have a null hypothesis that sepal width um, is not necessary for predicting sepal length, uh, the p-value for that null hypothesis is 0.15. Down here we have codes which are telling us how R decides, decides to use asterisks. So essentially um, the smaller the p-value, the more asterisks R is going to decide to write over here. But you should still use your own judgment as far as cutoff for a p-value. What do we have down here? Uh, 0.825 is the estimated standard error of the residuals. How much do the points vary from the line? These two quantities are a measure of the line fit. We didn't discuss them in this pilot. Um, the multiple R squared is exactly equal to the correlation between X and Y squared. And the bigger this number, the better. Down in the bottom is a test comparing this regression model to the equal means model. It compares this model to the same model where we're predicting y without x. I'm going to say that again to make sure it's clear. This right here is a test that looks to see whether the model that we've specified is any better than a model that just gives the same prediction for every data point regardless of x. So we have a test statistic. The reference distribution is called f and has a couple degrees of freedom. We didn't discuss those in this course. And then it has a p-value. In other words, here we do not have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the equal means model is good enough. We don't need the regression. Note that this p-value is the same as this p-value up here. Why is that? Well, if we only have one predictor, the test for whether we need that predictor is the same as the test for whether we need any predictor at all. These two tests are actually the same uh, when we only have one predictor. The output of the LM function, the output of the regression, LM1, comes with some other helpful values. So LM1 dollar sign coef um, is the set of coefficients, so we can just spit out the intercept estimate and the slope estimate. They're the same numbers we had up here. Um, but this is helpful for doing things like plotting these. We can get the coefficients right off. If we want to get all the residuals for each data point, what is its own y value minus the um, y value predicted on, by the line? Okay, well, so here we have all the residuals for all the points in the data set. That can be helpful for making plots and for checking. 
We also have the fitted values. For each data point, what is the prediction the line makes? Okay, and this is also helpful for making graphics. We can also use the confint function to look at confidence intervals for each of the estimates. So the confidence interval uh, for, our, for the intercept is right here. The confidence interval for the slope is right there. And we have confidence intervals for intercept and slope because we don't know what they are. We're predicting them. We're estimating them. And so um, the idea here is that we're 95% sure that the true slope of this line is between negative 0.53 and 0.08. We can also run the same regression in a simpler way. Instead of writing data dollar sign sepal length and data dollar sign sepal width, you can just write the variable names themselves, sepal.length tilde sepal.width, and then afterwards specify that the data set is called iris. And that's often much more helpful. You can plot the data. So here I'll plot uh, sepal length against sepal width. There's the data. And you can easily use the AB line function to add the regression line. Remember that one of the ways to use the AB line function is by specifying the intercept and the slope, and that's exactly what LM1 dollar sign coef is. And if I do that, there's the regression line uh, right there. How do you check the assumptions? We haven't talked a lot about regression assumptions, but one helpful way to look at regression assumptions is to make a plot of the residuals against the fitted values for each point. So each data point is represented here once, its residuals here, its fitted value is here. What we're looking for is a pattern, um, and what you want to look at is as you go across, um, do the values seem like they're kind of normally distributed, um, for the residuals are kind of normally distributed for each fitted value. And here I think this actually is kind of a suspicious looking plot, it doesn't look that good. I know from my knowledge of this data set is that it's because I should include species as a predictor as well. I can see patterns, I see a strip of dots here and a strip of dots here, and we shouldn't see those. There shouldn't be patterns in a residual versus fitted values plot if the model is actually appropriate. R also has some default plots. I don't suggest using them. I'd always rather make my own so I can make all the labels up myself and so that the plots don't include anything that I don't understand. Just so you know. Okay, so I click, I wrote plot LM1. Gives me a blank plot, but if I press return, I'll see a plot. There's the a more complicated version of the residuals versus fitted values plot. The only thing that's helpful here is some of the more extreme points are labeled with their row numbers. So if I want to know what this weird point is up here, now I know it's in row 132. Gives me a normal quantile quantile plot because one of the assumptions behind regression is that the residuals are normal. Um, so this is a plot to help you check that. Another plot looking at residuals. Another one so looking at different types of outliers. I don't think you need plots like this, but you can make them. Um, but those are the, the automatic plots that come out of the regressions.